Good morning to all of you here, to all of you who may be watching us on, online, uh, whether Sunday morning or sometime later. We are honored, we are privileged. Uh, who, who am I that, that I should have this such a blessing to be in your presence uh, and, uh, and that you have shared, chosen to share our time here together? Uh, of course, it is not just us, right? We are here in the presence of the Lord. Gracious God, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for, for allowing us this, this time. Indeed, who am I? Who are any of us? That you, would, that you would even notice us in the vast expanse of your universe. And yet you do. And yet you know us. You know everything about us. You already know the, the, the hurts and the pains, the fears and the joys. You already know the things that are preoccupying us now and, um, and how hard it is for us to, to, uh, to set our minds on you. Help us, Lord, to set our minds on you, that everything that happens here, um, everything that I think is going to happen, everything that, that we experience is, is by the power of your Holy Spirit and that all of it serves to bring you glory in Jesus name. Amen. All right folks, I want to give you a, uh, a quick rundown of the calendar. Uh, the, uh, the normal events are happening, but the, uh, there, there's no, there was going to be choir practice, um, but uh, since Beth's not here, well then we're putting, we're putting that off for a week. Uh, but during that time anyway, we hope that, that you did come, uh, or at least by the time that, that um, if not now, by the time I'm done talking, which will be a while from now, <laughs> uh, that we'll have, uh, you'll have an appetite because we have a, we have a lunch ready for you. Um, and I think, I think you're, you've got everybody here covered, right? I mean, there's, we, we have enough food for, for you all. So whether you were planning on staying for, for lunch, um, we hope that you will, and uh, there, will be, uh, there will be donations for missions, but that's not required for you to, to join us. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's on you. Um, so we hope that you will, will take the time following the service to, to join us there. Uh, other events, uh, on the first and the third Tuesdays is when we have our breakfast at Scramblers. This will be a third Tuesday. so. Uh, so there will be a group of us there on Tuesday morning. Uh, Thursday, finance and trustees will meet. Uh, I, I don't think that we've got a sign up for dartball out there, but, but the, uh, the dartball season will be starting up in October. So um, not this Monday, but a week from Monday, we'll start doing, uh, doing uh, practices. Um, not that practice makes us any better, but at least it gives, it gives us an opportunity to see who's interested. So if you, if you haven't been there before, um, or you haven't attended on a, on a Sunday afternoon, uh, Monday evening, uh, starting the 23rd, um, you are welcome to, to come and, and have fellowship with us. Now, because um, uh, of Kurt's fall this morning, um, Kurt and Loretta are not here, and so um, she has asked uh, to, for, for me to uh, announce or remind you that they're still collecting. In fact, in fact, we had to get another tub because your response has been good so far uh, for Food for Paws, uh, which is a program run by uh, Meals on Wheels, or I guess they have a new name now that's more descriptive of all that they, all that they do for, for seniors, and uh, including this, which is to get uh, pet food uh, to seniors as well. So. Uh, there's still, a, there's still a tub out there. They're still taking donations for two more weeks. Um, and, uh, and so we encourage you to, to bring that in. I want to um, draw your attention to the prayer list. Uh, as uh, a couple of persons have already mentioned, Beth and, and Curtis uh, uh, have just been added to the prayer list. Uh, we have, a, we have three that have, that have passed away recently and we want to continue to remember uh, their family and friends and, um, and continue to, we are, we are blessed that, that Trudy is here again, but we know that, um, that she is, uh, 
she's recently been in the hospital herself. Um, are there others that should be in our prayer list? Okay, reminder then that, of course, this is, this is part of a much larger prayer list, and if you are, if you are not receiving this, then, um, then please contact the office and we can have it sent to you. Um, but I commend these uh, to your prayer list and to your prayers. And then a reminder that uh, we will, during the service, uh, we will have a time of the passing of the peace where uh, if you are new here, people will offer to shake your hand, maybe even offer to give you a hug. Um, that's not required, of course. I uh, just wanted to forewarn you that that may happen. And it's, and it's not a time for a lot of small talk because I won't give you much time. Uh, about a minute and a half, and, uh, and, and it's just the opportunity for us to, to welcome one another. Um, I've, um, I've had churches where there, there have been persons who, um, who have said that sometimes it's, it's um, one of the few places that they ever get contact with persons, uh, particularly persons who, who care. And, uh, and we will also, at the time of the benediction, we'll also invite you to, to hold hands as well. And if you intended to, to give an offering, uh, we're not going to receive an offering um, as, as we have in the past, since most of our givers give either online or, or through the mail. But there are baskets in, by both of the doors back there. Uh, so if you intended to give an offering, we will, we will still gladly receive your money and, or, or, or whatever uh, other resources. And, um, and you can drop it off in, the, in, um, in one of those baskets. So I think that's um, I think that's it for the announcements. So is there is there anything I've missed? All right. Again, reminder: um, we we have it closed, so so the um, so the, the the smell of the food shouldn't be too distracting. But um, but but it will be um, a time of fellowship afterwards. Now we're going to start with a couple of choruses, um, and I and I thank Becky for. For, for volunteering to, to come help. It's, it's actually um, more difficult than I realized in, in trying to, to lead song solo. Uh, but um, these choruses, this one, this one actually is, is meant to, there's a, there's a dance that goes with it, but, um, but I figured that it may not be that familiar to you yet. And, and also it can be done as a round or, or, or if, it's, if it's done as a dance, it gets faster and faster and keeps going. But, um, but we'll just kind of go over it a bit because it indeed um, gives us the purest kind of praise, just remembering who he is. So will you stand please and let us sing together. Some, um, some, some random God out there, that some, some being that's far removed from us, but one that not only created us, but, but, uh, but has loved us more than his own life, so much to come into our midst and, and, to, and to, be, uh, to be one of us and to, and to bear our sin, our burdens uh, in his life. And not only that, 
he, he continues to be in, in present in the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so while there is, we, we live in a world that has plenty of evil. I don't think I have to argue that with, with any of you, right? But, but we remember as this chorus reminds us, uh, there's actually a whole, there's verses that go with this, but, but we'll do the chorus this time just to remind, a reminder that the Spirit is with us in spite of what's around us in the world. Great. Some of you might have heard it between then and now. Uh, <laughs> but one of the reasons that I, um, one of the things that I think about when I, I think of this song uh, as, as, the, as the last chorus alluded to the, the, the presence of evil all around us. And, and in the 1500s, that was, that was um, crystal clear to, to the, the religious leaders, whether Catholic or, or Protestant. And, um, of course, Luther understood that it was that that it's not persons when he when he talks about this world is filled with devils. He's saying that that Satan uh, takes us captive to do his will, and, and our job is is to is to is to is to preach to declare uh, freedom from that captivity. Uh, but um, but for Luther, I, I think about it. I imagine him taking this song, which he which he wrote using word, using a melody of of bar tune. I mean, it was a little it was a little more lively than what we've what we've made it over the years. Um, and I don't know that I could sing. But if, of course, it all rhymed and it was perfect in German too. Um, but um, but I think about when whenever they were singing this. Well, then they knew that. See, Luther's life was always under threat, right? And as well as his whole church. Um, when they were singing this, they, they knew that there was a good possibility, that a, even a probability, that at least several of them were going to die for their faith. Um, in that instance, it wasn't, it wasn't um, so much from, from non-believers as Catholics versus Protestants and so forth. Um, but it's with this mindset then that Luther's church would have, would have gathered together and sung this hymn.
say a word, to, a word of welcome, I guess. I, I could have just let you start singing, but um, some of you may not know Nathan and Sandy, and, and by chance is, is it's actually more than that, but, there's, but, the, but the others are, are not well enough to be here with us. Um, but, um, but we appreciate Nathan and Sandy bringing, um, bringing their gifts and, um, and uh, their dedication to us today. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain. You've got peace of mind like you've never known. But things change when you're down in the Don't lose faith, for you're never alone, for the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, He'll make them right. so easy when life's at its best now it's down in the valley of trials and temptation that's when your faith is really put to the test for the God on the but you have to have faith. That's what lifts you up. And I look at Kathy and Spurge and they went through a terrible time when I was the secretary here and it was really difficult, but they never, never lost their faith. They, they held right on to it. And that's what we have to do. So the next song is Faith Unlocks the Door. Prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Words are so easily spoken, a prayer without faith 
is like a boat without an oar. Have faith when you speak to the master. That's all he asks you for. Prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. How many times have you prayed for something big or small? How long did you have to wait? Or did the answer come at all? Words are mere expressions of thoughts and nothing more. Believing is what really counts. Faith is what unlocks the door. Have faith when you speak to the master. That's all he asks you for. Prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the Nathan and Sandy, and, and now let's take a short time to greet one another with the signs of peace and love in the name of our Lord Jesus. Go ahead. I guess so.
because God, you have been, you've given us everything. What, what have we given? We, we give of, of what we have, but it all comes from you in the first place. And Lord, we know that, that you gave without, without any strings attached. You have you blessed us even before we believed. You blessed us. You blessed many who are, who are still searching. Lord, we, we want our giving to be as magnanimous as yours. There's no way it can be because, because you give so much and, and every aspect of your being has been a gift. But Lord, bless the giving that we do, remind us that it is who we are, who we are meant to be, and, and magnify those gifts that they indeed um, not just serve our need to give, but that they make a difference in the world around us. May it be so, Lord, that, that these gifts, whether the gifts of our, of our, our money, or the gifts of our time, or the gifts of our our touch, our, our listening ear, our, our helping hands, that all of these gifts serve to, to further your kingdom work and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. My reading from the, the middle of the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, a um, little recap to, to how the chapter started with, uh, with, with Jesus getting a question of the Pharisees about divorce. Um, uh, and I, I attempted to do something with that last week. I realized, though, it, that it became a lot more complicated, and I started zipping through slides and so forth. Uh, suffice to say, I guess, that it, as I read it, the a big part of what they were, what they were asking is, uh, is when is it, uh, first of all, understand that, that my, my sense is that, that divorce was a very common thing in Jesus' time, and, and particularly among the early church. Um, when you think about that, there were only a handful of Christians in the first place, and, and if, one, if, if one person became a Christian, uh, and the spouse wasn't on board with that, then that probably was going to be the end of things uh, for, for, that, for that marriage. Um, so it was probably something that was fairly common. The, the religious leaders are asking, like, when is it okay to do this? Uh, Jesus' answer is it's never okay <laughs> uh, because God's intention was, was that, we would be, that we would be joined in relationship and that these relationships that we have with one another are permanent. Um, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Um, and that's probably going to get its biggest test in the, in the scripture for today. But anyway, after, after Jesus has this to talk, well then there is a talk, there is a time where he has, where he has children around them and he, ha and he has to remind the disciples what he had already said some before, that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. But speaking of entering the kingdom of God, um, then we read here in verse 17, that as he, Jesus, was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Now, I should pause there just for a minute because, because over the years I've heard people um, very carelessly assert that, that Jesus is saying he's not God here. <laughs> um, but you notice that's not what he's saying at all. Uh, he's being, as, as a rabbi, he is, he is doing the typical thing, which is to ask, answer a question with a question. If you go back, you'll notice that he did that just about, a, uh, he did that earlier in the chapter. Um, and, um, and, in, and in asking the question he is, he's, he's, um, he's pointing to, the, uh, to, to this young man, the, the seriousness of this question. You call me good, no one is good 
but God alone. Uh, now, I'm one that, hasn't, that doesn't talk a whole lot about the, the goodness of God. Um, I, I said to a person once, you know, I'm kind of, in, I'm, in some ways I'm comfortable talking about that. I prefer to talk about the godness of God. Um, the problem is that when we talk about God's goodness, well then we, it's very easy for us to sort of slip into the idea that God is good for me uh, or good to me and then it becomes about us. Um, I believe that God is good. Um, in fact, for that matter, I believe that God defines what is good. Um, that what is, that's, that's how we determine what is good is what is, what is good for God. But, but I also recognize that what is, what is good for God, for God's plan, and for his glory may not, be, may not appear to be good for me. In fact, it, it may well be that at some point that my death will be good for, for the glory of God. Um, in that case, one of the places that we, uh, we used to argue with the Reformed tradition, that's the Reformed Church and the Presbyterian Church, Church of Christ, uh, that, uh, because they believed in predestination. But, it, but, it was, um, but every pastor at one point when he went through, when he went through his ordination was, uh, was, asked to, um, was asked that if it were part of God's plan, for you to be condemned, um, what would you say to that? And they would say that, that if, it is, if it is in God's plan, then let me con be condemned for the glory of God. Well, anyway, so, so, he, so he sort of gets an, on him on this, this question, why do you call me good? But then, but then he goes on to say to the young man, you know the commandments, right? You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Actually, those are the same commandment. Just a reminder that, that, that's, that that's what that commandment about bearing false witness is. Uh, it's not about lying um, just in general. It's lying in order to hurt someone. So, uh, so when, when I was a kid and they used, to, they used to tell us is you have a real moral dilemma like if the abuser wants you to tell him where, where his wife is hiding, um, but no moral dilemma there. You don't have to, there's no, there's no commandment to tell the truth in that instance, right? You shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, and honor your father and mother. So that's, that's five of the commandments, right? He skips the first four, uh, the um, no other gods before me, no graven image, don't take the name of the Lord in vain, uh, the, remember the Sabbath. Uh, and he focuses on our, the interpersonal ones, the ones that have to do with our connections with one another. And then he also skips the last one, right? You shall not covet. Um, and maybe he does that on purpose. Um, maybe. I guess you can, you can decide that for yourself. But in any case, when he talks about these five, well, then the young man says to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. It's that Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Now, they said to love him, that's the, the agape love here. He, um, and, and I think Mark, Mark wants to make it clear here that, the, that he's not just trying to, to, uh, to dismiss this, this young man or whatever and uh, try to make things particularly difficult. It's Jesus is looking at this young man and he says, I, I want you to be one of my disciples. I, I really want you to, to find life. I, um, I believe in you. And so it says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. And when he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Now, I'm going to stop the reading at this point um, so that we can have a little prayer and song because, because I want you to stew about that a bit because that's my job is to get you to stew about some things. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and let us pray to our Lord.
kid, I remember. I remember hearing this passage, and and I don't remember how old I was, but but I I felt particularly low <laughs> because I because I assumed that yes, um, you don't want to give up the the riches that you have, even though of course I was a I was a kid and you know the the riches of home and all of that. Um, the idea of of, uh, of of dropping everything and 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 going to serve Jesus, who at this point was was just some kind of an invisible savior to me, uh, was uh, was a rather terrifying kind of prospect. Um, but I just assumed it was because I was a coward, um, and I guess I probably still am. And to, but but maybe it was because I also had this image. Um, you, you might have heard about St. Anthony. It says that St. Anthony was a rich man who, who a rich young man who happened to, to come into the church uh, just right, the time to just right was then when the, when the priest was reading this passage of scripture and he said, you know, go sell what you own, give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. And, um, and St. Anthony, not knowing any better, um, just walked into the church. He heard that. Well, then he decided to go out and do that, and and sold everything, and and uh, and then went on to to become a monk. I presumably, perhaps, in solitude by himself. But at some point, it was a part of a part of a group. Um, also, we may have heard about Saint Francis, who who similarly did this kind of thing. But I've noticed that even when, even when I hear people quote this, well then, they, they see it as a, as a call to poverty. But, but over the years I've looked at this and I realized that this is a call to discipleship, right? You notice that we, we I focused and, and most people seem to focus on the first half of what Jesus says and they forget that the last part, come follow me. Um, Jesus wants this young man to be one of his disciples, right? But, but in order for him to be a disciple, he's got to be all in. He can't, he can't have all of this other stuff out there. I mean, even if he, he, could, he could sort of leave it, he could spend time with Jesus and have somebody else manage it, but it's always going to be there in his mind, right? He's not going to be able to be fully devoted to, to being a disciple. Um, and... Um, and, and Mark wants us to remember that, that Jesus really wanted this man. He loved him, uh, but he still wasn't going to, to make it any easier on him. He wasn't going to try to, to convince him to, to even just think about it. Although, although when, you realize, when you think about it, if he was actually to do this stuff, to sell what you own, give them the money to the poor, uh, that's, that's not something that can be done in just a, a moment's time. So as we, as we go on from this, you know, um, we've, we've struggled with this over the years, right? We've, we have our various ways of trying to soften the blow of this. I, um, a, ma a man at one time ago said to me uh, when he was trying to, to encourage me to invest in a, a business opportunity, um, I won't tell you which one, but you, can, you, might, you might have some guesses. And he said, you know, you could make a lot of money doing this kind of thing. And, and, and I, know you're, I know you're a religious person. You think, you think it, um, you know, I used to think too that money is the root of all evil and stuff. But then, I, but then I actually read that it's the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. Of course, then he went on and showed me the magazines about how the, the higher-ups in this business had their, their lavish mansions and their, and their fancy boats and their fancy cars and stuff. And I says, well, it looks like a whole lot of love of money that's going on in, uh, in these pages. Um, so when, so, so we, we focus on that part. But as I said, the... The real question here is a question about discipleship. And this, and this slide that I, that I put up at the beginning of every, it's just there at the beginning of every service, is, um, is perhaps bears some, some words at this point. Uh, some years ago, a group of pastors and I were talking about that for, as for the, our, what we thought God's plan for our whole region was, and, and we talked about what it meant to be a disciple. 
and we came up with this. There's, this is actually very similar to what you find in a number of denominations, and perhaps there are better ways of saying it. But, but we thought about disciple in, in at least four different, different marks. That is, if, if you're a disciple of Christ, then you are involved in some kind of service. You're doing something for the benefit of others. There's something, something somewhere in your life. And, um, and you are also a student that you are, you are growing, you are learning uh, in, in some kind of environment that um, we, we do expect, and it's always been a, a, um, expected that persons would do their own private Bible reading and stuff. But unless, unless we actually uh, seek to, to learn from each other, well, then we, we very rarely grow in doing that. And then um, to be a regular in corporate worship and private prayer, um, those, are, those are big things, right? Um, over the decades, in the last several decades, well, then, the churches have tended to focus on a, a couple of things about being a Christian, right? To, to, be, um, to, to, to pray a sinner's prayer, to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then to, and then to attend the church somewhere. And, and I realize that still today, while then probably the vast majority of, of Christians uh, believe in, that it comes down to those kinds of things. Uh, and so being a regular in worship and, and but also having that private prayer life to, to, to dedicate time where we pray to God and, and, um, and, and where we do look to Scripture ourselves is, is so important to continue our walk with the Lord. Because this discipleship was what Jesus talked about following me is really walking with the Lord, right? And then, and then the fourth thing there was that, is that it's, as Christians, we are called to, to reach out to others, that we would, we would pray that there would be in our, in our life, there would be pre-Christians, like persons who are not yet Christians, or, or new Christians for whom we can share uh, the witness of, of what God has done in our lives. Now, now, when we came up with this sort of scheme, and like I said, we've sort of borrowed and stole it from several other places, but, but one of the things that occurred to me was that if we, if we look at our lives the way the moderns do, that we, we look at what it means to be, you know, to, to, to be fully ourselves, to be a, an authentic self, that we could look at this and we could say, you know, that if, you're, if your faith seems dry or, or it's, it seems... Or, or you just feel um, you, you get to the point where you're almost take it or leave it, then, then you can probably look at this scale and you can probably see that it's because one of these areas or more are, are lacking in your life. If you're, if you're, not, doing, if you're not doing something that's, that's serving the needs of others. And, and even, if we're, even if we're closed in, well, then we... we uh, even if we are, we're not able to, to physically get out, well, then... The, the power of, 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 of writing, of phone calls, and things like that um, can so, still be a, a valuable service to others. Um, we can be making a difference in people's lives. And, and so this is sort of a modern take on what, on what it would look like to be a disciple. But, it's, but among those things, you can see is almost all of those things, uh, with the exception of the private prayer life, Almost all those things have to do with being in communion with others. So, so when Jesus was calling on this young man, it's not that, it's not to, because I want you to live a life of poverty, it's what, that I want you to be all in with us. And that's the thing. It's like, there was a time, you know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They, uh, they decided that they were going to they were going to give some property to the church at the time, but, um, and they were, but, but the, it wasn't that they were giving the property. In fact, for that matter, they didn't even have to do that. Even Peter said to them, when the property was unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? You, nobody, nobody told you you needed to give the property. Nobody told you that, um, that you had to do any of that. But... But what happened was that they were trying to make people believe that they were all in when they kept some back for themselves. 
And they could have well said that, you know, we're, we're giving you some of, of what we offer, but, but, um, but, what, but what Jesus was calling this young man is to be all in. And so Jesus goes on to say, he looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. Now, now realize that the disciples were not, they certainly did not consider themselves wealthy at all uh, by any means. Um, now, they, we know that things were, you know, that they weren't, um, when we, if we think of them as just as being poor beggars, well, then we're probably thinking more of St. Francis. That was, that was the way he saw Jesus. But, but we know that the, when they traveled together, that they had, um, they, they had weapons to, because they had to defend themselves in, the, in, in going through these deserted roadways. And, and, they, and they usually had money, and they usually had food supplies and so forth. Um, and they were, probably, they, they were probably even making some money at some point in order to keep the group going. Uh, so they, but, but they also, they didn't have the benefit of the last 2,000 years we have where, where, we've, where we've talked about the blessings of, of being uh, blessed are the poor and so forth. They still assumed that, that wealth was the obvious sign of God's favor, right? Um, even Job, for instance, who was, who was a righteous man, and so he was, he was wealthy and prosperous, and even when he lost all of that at the end, he became wealthy and prosperous again. Uh, and so that was very much in their mindset. That when, so when Jesus says, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, then um, this, is totally, uh, this is totally out of their minds. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Notice how he calls them children. And, uh, and just a few verses earlier when he, was, when he was blessing the children, he said that unless you, unless you, enter, unless you become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Um, in essence, then, that's what he's asking this, what, what he's asking this young man to do, or what he's telling them is what he, what he needs to do if he, wants, if he wants the kingdom, is that he has to become like a little child, um, that he has to, he's going to, ha to be all in to, to this ministry, all in to be part of this group. And then Jesus goes on to say, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So you've probably heard that persons over the years have had some trouble with this. In fact, uh, around 300 years after Christ is when somebody said, you know, maybe that word that says camel was really meant to be like a, a, a rope or a cable. Uh, although even a big cable going through the eye of the needle is still, is still kind of an impossibility. And then there are others uh, who said that the eye of the needle, that must refer to a gate. Um, that, that seems to appear somewhere around the 1100s. Somebody came up with that. It may be older than that, but, but we don't have any other evidence but that than somebody's idea that there was this narrow gate that if you had your camel, you could squeeze them in there, but you had to take all the stuff off. And so, and so it's not impossible for someone who is rich, but it's, it's very hard. Um, but clearly, that's not what's meant. Um, this is a first century ne needle. And um, in fact, I, I should tell you, this one is actually for sale <laughs> um, on, online. Uh, first century Jerusalem. And, uh, and this is a camel. And, um, and it's possible that there might be a needle that's somewhere like near the camp, foot of the camel. So if he steps on it just right, the eye of the needle might go through the camel, but, <laughs> but not the other way around. Um, and besides that, Jesus talks about camels other times too. When he talks to the religious leaders, he claims that he, he, he chastises them um, as straining out a gnat, but swallowing a camel. So, so, the, so the, best, the best understanding of this is that Jesus is trying in, in, his, in, in, a, in his way that, that should be clear 
that it is impossible for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Um, and so, and so, so they ask, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. So just a reminder again that we don't enter the kingdom of God on our own. We don't. And, you know, and, and think about this. If, the, if that rich young man had actually done what Jesus said, or at least did the first part, if he had actually decided, okay, I will, I will sell all I have and I will give the money, the money to the poor so that I am poor, so now that I am in poverty, that, that wouldn't have gotten him into the kingdom. It would have been, it would have been his efforts, but, but, the, but the one, uh, but, but unless he followed Jesus, unless he was all in for God's kingdom, um, God is the one who invites us into the kingdom. Now Peter began to say to him, Lord, we have left everything and followed you. So Peter says, look, we, we are all in. Now that doesn't, now Peter was a fisherman. He, it didn't mean that he wouldn't be able to go back to fishing if he, if he so chose. But, but he has chosen at this point that, that, that's, that that's not his life. And then Jesus makes this um, rather uh, disturbing statement. Jesus said, truly I tell you that there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers, no fathers because we already have, because we already have a heavenly father, uh, mothers and children and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Now, as I said, this should be rather disquieting or uh, con concerning because, because isn't, when he says to leave a house, doesn't that mean um, probably leaving a spouse as well? Um, and, and we're not sure about that. We, we know that Peter at one point was, was married um, because he has a mother-in-law, but, um, but we don't know if at that point if he, if he had, was already previously divorced or a widower or, or whatever. And, um, and even beyond that, the idea of leaving children as well. Um, from a man's point of view, of course, the, the, the women took care of the children, so they may have thought that that, was, that that was not something that they needed to be concerned about. But there isn't a sense that I don't think there's a sense that, this, that Jesus ever meant for us to, to assume that we simply leave everything behind and, um, and, and, not, and not honor our commitments. Uh, I had a man who came to church one time. Um, well, he came, he came several times. And, and uh, in one conversation with him, I asked him, what was it that brought you to church? And he said, well, first of all, over, I had been living with a woman and her two two younger sons uh, for several years. They're, they're not, I'm not their natural father, but I'm, I'm the father that they've had for, for several years. But, but, but then he said, but then I was, I was convicted that, that, that I've been living with this woman unmarried for, for all these years, and so I kicked them out. Uh, and then he said to me, and then after a while I thought about it and I thought, well, that wasn't right before, but this doesn't seem to be right either. So I invited him back in and now I want to try to figure out how do, how do, we, work this, how do we work this out? Um, and I said to him, well, the first thing in wanting to work this out is to, is to confess that we can't work it out on our own, that, that we need to we need to humbly ask for, for God's forgiveness and, and, uh, and, and work through the situation. And, and it took some time, but eventually they, they were married and, and went on with life. You know, Jesus started his ministry when he was about 30 years old. Uh, there's, there's three theories as to why he waited so long, because for, for many of them, I mean, that. I mean, 30 was, it's like my kids said when they were kids, you know, the 30 was over the hill to them. 
um, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but, but one, one theory was that Jesus went and did this ministry all over other parts of the world, which, which we have no evidence of, and kind of strange, the idea that he would go all over the world and then come back to his own people. Um, the second reason is, is, is not very common, but, but it could be that Jesus had to, had to time this particularly based on, the, based on the prophecy in Daniel 9, and that, and that's kind of a, that prophecy is kind of tricky, but, but, there, but it could be that Jesus was waiting for a particular time for that reason. But, the, but the, probably the most popular idea is that Jesus waited until he was 30 because, because Joseph was no longer in the picture. Um, we, we know there's no mention of him in Jesus' adult life. And, uh, and we know that Jesus had brothers and sisters, so, so it's a, so it, it, it's a, a kind of assumed that he, he probably stayed at home until, until, his, until his siblings were old enough that he could, that he could leave them behind. Um, so, so these are not things that happen uh, just in a moment. Um, and I say that partly for our benefit then because, because most of us are not all in yet. Um, Maybe there's a sense in which we're never all completely all in to, to, uh, to leaving everything, in essence, to be a, a Jesus follower. Um, maybe, that, maybe that's a continually evolving thing throughout our lives. But it's something that, that does happen over time. And just because, just because you haven't done it yet so far doesn't mean that, uh, that, I, you know, that, that, that we can just turn this aside and say, okay, um, you don't, you don't have to worry about this because you're not rich or you're not, you're not like this young man. Um, all of us have that, that challenge. Because Jesus even said in another point that he told two parables. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all he had and bought it. And that may take time to divest oneself of all these things. But, but if we understood the value of the kingdom of heaven, right, the kingdom of God, then we understand that there's nothing in this life that's worth holding on to, uh, in, order to in order to get it. We, we need what, what Peter says, right? Lord, we have left everything and followed you. That's, that's the challenge for all of us because, because that's where the life is. That's where, that's where our, our, our lives were meant to be. Um, that's where we find the, the fullness of joy and the fullness of everlasting life here and now and in the life to come. Now Jesus ended this with, a, with, a, with one phrase that, that actually leads into the next story, so I just want to say it and, and leave it, but, but he, he says that, that we will receive all of these blessings and in the end eternal life, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. This is a witness to the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gracious God, how can we say thanks for all the things you have done for us? And we, we've held back we're afraid to be poor, we're afraid to be alone. Remind us, Lord, that, that we were meant not to be alone, but to be able to put our trust in others. Remind us how we as a church can be the haven that, that so many, indeed a whole, a whole world needs even if they don't recognize that they need it. Remind us, Lord, that, that in you we have the, the treasure that truly matters. 
And let the poor man say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done. Lord, we are in a world that is in pain and, and hurt and, and so beyond us. We lift up our, our, our family and friends, the, the hurting, the, the ones we've mentioned already, but there, are, but there are so many others. And many of them suffer because they are alone, because they, they hold on. Lord, your mercy, hear their prayers and lift them up. Remind them that you have made them and all of us for much more than this. And we pray for our nation. Lord, we are, we are bombarded. But, but Lord, you are the King of Kings the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace. So help us in the midst of all of the confusion around us to put our trust in you. May our leaders put their trust in you. May you have mercy on this nation, on the nations of the world. Lord, be our God, be our hope, be our everything. We ask it in Jesus' name and we pray his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand for our last hymn, our closing hymn.
and, and of course thank you to Tammy and, and to, to Nathan and Sandy for, for your contributions and thank you to all of you for being, for being a part of that. Your, your prayers, your, your presence, the spirit that is in this place. Is, uh, it's his spirit, it's not mine, we, we don't control it. But, but it's a reminder that, that as we are continuing in, in our quest to, to leave everything else that doesn't matter so that, we can, so that we can be with the one who does, know that, that there's a whole world out there of persons who likewise need to do the same. And, and they need a guide. A helping hand, a loving touch, a smile, a, a tender word. Um, you'll have that opportunity sometime today even to, to offer that word of grace to, to at least one or more people as we leave this place. But of course, we, we hope that you'll, you'll eat first with us and, um, and offer that to each other um, and then to the world. Because we can do that not because we have that power to do it, but because the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are with you now and forever. Amen.